Okay, today we're going to talk about clarinet. Um, and this is a little bit out of the original sequence that was in the course outline, but since most of you are going to be moving to clarinet right after spring break, I thought it would be helpful to address that before we made the change rather than during the change. So this is a little bit lengthy, um, and there are going to be some really specific things on clarinet. Clarinet can be a little complicated initially. Um, the cool part about clarinet for me as a brass player teaching it, and I think it's my favorite instrument to teach if I had to say, um, is that once you get, make sure they under, children understand, students understand the instrument well and do everything correctly, then it just works. And it's really wonderful that way. Uh, whereas a lot of you, um, you could do one thing on flute, but maybe you couldn't play high, maybe you couldn't play low, maybe the fingerings were complicated and that. Clarinet's not like that at all. If you're making a sound properly, it just works, provided you have good hand position, good equipment, all those kinds of things. So I'm going to try to go as uh, deliberately slow as we need to for this, and I hope it'll help. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Okay. This is what your clarinet looks like. These are bliss clarinets. They are a little different than traditional clarinets. They came out about five, six years ago and partly designed that they're supposed to be a little bit more maintenance free instruments and they're supposed to have a little bit more of a contemporary look for today's contemporary student. I don't know how effective they are in either but we're happy to have them and they're really good instruments for a beginning, affordable beginning instrument. Um, much like most other wind instruments, the mouthpiece dictates the quality of what you're going to result in playing. And so with that in mind, understand virtually universally the mouthpiece that comes, the stock mouthpiece that comes with the clarinet you purchase are pretty much all garbage. They're pretty much all garbage. And in fact, the mouthpieces we're going to give you to use in class are Phobes mouthpieces, which are about the best the best cheapest mouthpiece that we can buy and of course at Texas Tech we like to do things cheaply um, and uh, it really makes a big difference we are not using the mouthpieces that came with these instruments those have been discarded and, and literally they have been they're just not good mouthpieces at all um, so your mouthpiece condition and of course the quality of the reeds that you use are going to make a big difference first off parts of the instrument I guess well, you have two large joints, and you will notice that one of them has two, a cork on each end, the other one has cork just on one end. The one with the cork on both ends is the upper joint. The one with the single cork, when we put the cork on the bottom, is the lower joint. The upper joint goes into the lower joint. But as we do that, I hope you all can notice that there is, let me get this right there, there is right here a bridge key. This key goes over this key. It bridges the two joints. Also, and this is very unique to this model clarinet, these Bliss clarinets, you have a little notch right here that fits into a little, or you have a little, uh, protrusion right here that fits into a notch right there. So as we put these together that notch should line up and we want to make sure that, that key fits over the other one. Now you have a great deal of keys on both ends so it's best to grip the instrument down at the bottom where there are fewer keys, grip it at the top where there are fewer keys, then with a twisting motion watching the bridge key assemble those two parts together. Keep your eye on the bridge key, don't let any collision happen between those two keys and you can watch that. Well, One thing to keep in mind as instruments are brand new these corks are very dry. We have to use repeated applications of cork grease um, which could take a lot of time at the very beginning with your clarinet classes and such. So plan for that that they're going to have to do that. Um, and you have four places where cork needs greased. One, two, three, and then the bottom of the mouthpiece is the fourth place. And they're all going to be quite dry. Once you get the corks broken in, we don't have to reapply cork grease hardly often at all, depending on the climate you're in and such. Okay, so upper joint, hold at the top. Lower joint, hold at the bottom. Watching the bridge key, 
twist together, and assemble. There we go. All right. And that notch in the front, I don't know if you can see that or not, right here has fit together. The protrusion is in the notch. All right, next thing. This is the bell, the part that looks like a bell. The bottom of the clarinet is going to go on that. So again, holding it at the bottom, and in some cases, I'm going to hold it up here so it's on camera, but you can put this actually in your lap, the bell on your lap, on your knee, if you will, and then just twist it on. If you're a real OCD, you want to make sure that the name of the instrument is in the front. Does it matter? Not really. Okay, so we have that. Then, the piece that looks like a barrel is the barrel. And it only goes on the top one way. And again, holding the top at the top and then holding the barrel, just twist that on. Okay, so we've got the barrel on. Then finally, I'm going to lay this down. We have the mouthpiece, which in a perfect world comes with a protection cap because if our mouthpiece has any chips around the opening at all, it's garbage. It, it just will not work properly. So that's why this is here, is to protect that. It also, if you've got a reed on there, sometimes when you're going from place to place, it maybe um, delays the drying out of the reed, but that's really not the biggest reason for it. It's more for protection at all times. So we take that off, and then also on here, you have this device, which is called a ligature. And this is what secures the reed firmly, not tightly, firmly to the mouthpiece. Okay, and we'll get into that. These are a, a, a brand of ligature called Bonad ligatures that are designed so that the screws go on the top. So if you're right-handed, the screws are on the right side of the mouthpiece. Others you'll see are like this with the screws on the bottom. Most beginning horns come with that kind of a ligature. This is a more advanced ligature. Okay, So let's just pretend I have soaked this reed and so forth, and you would do that. That would be step one in assembly is take the reed out, which is the most likely thing to get um, damaged, place it in the mouth, and you'll notice the reed has an uncut part and then a cut part. We want to be soaking the reed past the cut part. Okay? And that needs to soak for about the time it takes, the entire time it takes to assemble the instrument. Now one thing living in a dry climate that really helps is before we apply the reed to the mouthpiece, if we'll take the butt end of the reed and just soak it for a second. Because in dry climates, a reed has um, veins through it. All the moisture's up here. This part's dry. In a really dry climate, the, the veins that are dry will suck really quickly all the moisture from the top down. So we wanna get a little moisture down here to uh, try to inhibit that from happening. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take the barrel back off. and I'm going to put the barrel and mouthpiece together because we're going to be using this almost on a daily basis. So our assembly for the beginning would not be exactly what I showed you. It would be for these three pieces, the upper joint, the lower joint, and the bell, but then we would stop, lay that down carefully, don't stand it like that, it gets knocked over, keys get bent, lay it down, keys up carefully, then we have our barrel, our mouthpiece, our ligature. Okay, next thing we want to do then is take our ligature screws. This is in my mouth, but I can't talk with it in my mouth, so I'm going to take mine out. Loosen these up a little bit, and then that allows us to slide this up. Then, you'll notice the mouthpiece has a tip, it has a fat end, and a thin end and it has a flat side and a curved side so does the reed it has a tip a thin end a thick end a curved side and a flat side so as we slide this up we slide 
the flat side against the flat, so flat to flat, fat to fat, thin to thin, tip to tip. And we slide that down and then slowly push the ligature down and on most, most mouthpieces there's a little line here that you can't see at all. Right here we want to make sure the ligature is down below that. We want to make sure that, sorry, the tip is lined up with the tip. You can see that I think. And then just tighten the screws just where they grip. Don't over tighten them because if you over tighten them it starts sliding. Okay? It just has to hold the reed in place, not permanently. All right? So, and we have the reed on. Teaching a class and probably teaching you guys to put the reed on is one of the most challenging things there is in clarinet playing. Like I talked about before, there's a lot of challenge at the beginning, but if you do all the basics right, it moves very, very, very quickly. All right. So we're ready to move on to embouchure, and that'll be the next thing. And this is one thing that's really unique about clarinet and single reed instruments in general, is forming the embouchure. And this is what we're going to use, the barrel and mouthpiece. And if everything is, if the reed is matched to the mouthpiece, and we have a medium lay mouthpiece with a medium soft or medium hard reed, medium, medium matched, which is what almost universally we use with beginners and even most of our advanced players in the United States. We should be, this should produce with a proper embouchure and a proper airstream a concert F sharp. Okay? And so that should be an F sharp. If anything, it might be a little bit on the high side, but that's okay if it is. Now, I just skipped over all the embouchure stuff and just made a sound. So let's back up and take a look at that. One of the key things on embouchure on clarinet is our top teeth are going to be on top of the mouthpiece. Our lower lip, the pink part of our lip, will just barely cover our bottom teeth. You do not want children to swallow their lower lip. And so, get this in position, which will result in a flat chin, lay this on there, teeth on top, seal with firm corners brought forward, and then just blow. And you have to use a pretty intense stream of air because clarinet is relatively resistant, much more so than flute, obviously. Now you may be asking, well, how much mouthpiece do you put in your mouth? Well, there's a really easy solution for that. If you look, and I don't know that you can see in this, if you look at it from a side angle, it's open at the top and at a point about right here, the reed and the mouthpiece touch. That spot right there is the spot we want to set here. That way all the reed that isn't touching, in other words, the part of the reed that's free to vibrate, is in the oral cavity. Another thing to consider is the angle. From me front on, you can't see the angle. What for, for most kids, normal proportions, if they're setting up straight, mouthpiece in, the end of the mouthpiece will point pretty close to their knees. And that, I think, is about from a straight up and down to here, about a 33, 30 to 35 degree angle. Okay, so it's not way down, it's not way out. And this is what's real important, that the head is up. If they have the mouthpiece down and their head down, that's the same as doing this. So this, in essence, is a duck call. All right, and that's all we do on that. So we'll review that in class and so forth. That's very important. Um, on the Essential Elements Interactive site, there are some really good videos about um, embouchure. Next thing, articulation. On all, re all woodwind instruments except the double reeds, I would teach articulation on the noisemaker part, the mouthpiece part, okay? Double reeds, I would do it on the whole instrument. And so what we want to do is identify the first taste bud, like we've talked about before, and the first taste bud strikes the tip of the reed. The air never stops, and the, the tip of the tongue strikes and goes to the bottom of the mouth as quickly as possible. 
and just by sound you can determine the amount of pressure it needs to strike and again like we did on flute if you'll start with rapid tonguing they'll use the air right and, and you'll feel that first taste bud strike there the biggest thing we want to watch out for students not doing articulation wise on clarinet is what's referred to as anchor tonguing and you may think this is impossible but it happens a lot what happens in anchor tonguing is they take the tip of their tongue they anchor it in the bottom of their mouth behind their back teeth and then they strike the reed with the middle of their tongue I mean it works but it doesn't work very well um, and unfortunately what beginning uh, method books and so forth ask them to do articulation wise allows them to get into that bad habit without you being able to perceive that they're doing it so every day I would say for the first six months probably of the school year every day you start with this make sure embouchures are good make sure they're getting an F sharp make sure they clean leak and rapid tongue check that fundamental all the time the reason is and I'll demonstrate this in class if you can make happen cleanly then everything else that happens with the fingers on the horn you immediately can probably play about a two and a half octave range if your fingers know what to do and I'll demonstrate that for you in class while we're talking about fingerings let's move back over to the horn itself left hand is on top right hand is on the bottom just like flute except we don't distort the first finger like we do on flute we don't have to create a chair um, both hands are in a flat C formation and I've given you some handouts with diagrams and so forth we'll start with the left hand the top hand what we want to watch there mostly is the thumb the thumb should not be straight up and down it should not be so it shouldn't be at 3 o'clock it shouldn't be at 12 o'clock it should be like at 1 30 and it has to cover this hole while simultaneously allowing you to operate the register key so it's either in midair on the hole or on the hole depressing the register key and then if you get the angle of the thumb right in the back then the fingers just naturally come across these upper keys and cover the three holes one two three pinky in midair which it's free to operate four different keys here the right hand is exactly the same thing four five six pinky free to cover these four keys but again thumb placement determines the placement of the front fingers just like on flute clarinet has a thumb rest we want that thumb rest to land where it is the bottom of the thumbnail for most people is right in the middle of the thumb rest and so that is directly across directly across uh, see if I can get it. there we go directly across from our fingers like when we pick up a pencil and so again we have the flat C and we support that so the entire weight of the clarinet rests on that right thumb now you'll notice your clarinets all have this sort of a key with a hole here unfortunately we don't have neck straps but almost universally in Texas everybody is going towards having clarinet players wear neck straps I think probably the majority of the players here at Tech use them and the reason is there's a preponderancy of developing carpal tunnel syndrome with the weight of the horn on that right hand it also just for beginners makes it so much easier so if we have a neck strap then what the thumb does it really isn't bearing weight it's just pushing the instrument out away from the body so yes neck straps sorry we don't have them okay so we have that and again fingering wise just like flute one two three four five six all right great job um, at whatever point we're going to put everything together the reed goes on the side where the thumbs are in the back away from towards the face away from the keys on the opposite side of the majority of the keys okay 
Um, some things on reeds. Reeds can't have chips. All reeds are not created equal. Um, professional clarinet players, serious clarinet players, when they buy a box of reeds, um, they will not play ever on all of them because some of them just don't work as well as others. As far as where you're coming from with your students and that, you can probably get use um, for uh, practice purposes and so forth out of every reed that they'll ever have. I think it's incredibly important that all of your students have some sort of a reed case like this. In fact, I think you have one in your case except it's black. Notice it holds four reeds, two on this side, two on this side. And if you will get your kids with a Sharpie or a big pen or something and label up here where the part that doesn't go in your mouth, number them one, two, three, four, and then teach your kids to rotate them every time they play. That way, they're not because as you play on reeds they become more pliable softer and then when you go to a new reed it's much harsher this way you're evenly breaking in four reeds and if one breaks then you just put a new one into the rotation so you don't always you're not they're not relying on my good reed they should have four reeds that work reasonably well they may have one they like better than the others but they should all work okay these kinds of cases are really helpful because they hold the end of the reed down after you've played and it's moist and keep it from turning into a uh, Ruffles potato chip basically on the end of it. As you can see this reed, I don't know if you can see it or not, has a chip in it. It's bad. So here's what we do with reeds like this. You give them the reed test and the reed always fails the reed test. Teach them to throw those suckers away. Okay. Um, reeds mouthpieces we'll talk about that more in class the Phobes mouthpieces are real good it's a medium lay mouthpiece it is a plastic mouthpiece so they're cheaper they run around thirty dollars and uh, but they're more susceptible they're thinner they're lighter um, a professional clarinet mouthpiece list prices between 120 and 150 dollars um, cash price you can get them for probably 60 percent of that price but you know discover whether it's a, a Van Doren tends to make the most consistent mouthpieces a B um, excuse me a 5RV Liar are real popular an M30 um, I've got something else written down here this is in your handout as we go through it here oh I can't find it maybe it's an M16 that sounds wrong though M13 Liar that's it a Van Dorn M13 liar or an M30 liar. Uh, Van Dorn makes probably 50 different clarinet mouthpieces. Okay, it does matter to have everybody match instruments, everybody to match mouthpieces. Um, on single reed instruments, that really pays off in terms of being easier to teach and easier to tune and work with kids in an ensemble if they have matched equipment and such. Uh, to go with those mouthpieces, you're looking at a Van Doren reed, probably starting kids, uh, if I was starting sixth graders, probably starting them at a two, probably by Halloween, moving them up to a two and a half, and then from there, never going harder than a three or a th maybe a three and a half in a rare case. If they think, if there's a need because they overplay that hard reed, then they probably need to be looking at going to a different mouthpiece also because of their physical setup or something. But the reed and the mouthpiece have to more or less match, medium to medium, wide to, wide to thin reed, narrow to thick reed, more resistant reed. Also, all brands of reeds are not the same. A Van Doren 2 is about like a Rico 3, which is about like a Mich Michelurri 4. Um, you just have to have stay in contact with your clarinet player friends or trust your music store and know what to what to use and so forth okay um, you'll notice in your packet you have additional information on hand position I think there's some good diagrams on where the fingers lie in terms of fingertips and then also in terms of embouchure setup and so forth so we'll talk through that in class a little bit especially as we start clarinet and that'll make more sense but I hope that this gives you a pretty good start looking at all those things and I know we have some clarinet players in class who probably have have uh, their two cents they want to get a bit, get in on all of this also so thank you very much